Well, uh, let's get started since we are running a little late and I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, so I guess uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us, Supervisor Marr. Uh, today we're hoping to go through a little bit of a you know open forum just to give you time to you know for Yimbies to hear directly from you and uh, you know just want to make sure you have time to really go deep in your uh, views on housing specifically uh, and uh, respond to some questions that we've gotten from the the membership um, as you know our lead um, and our club uh, endorsement voting process is happening uh, very soon so people will be using this as a way to kind of gauge their sense of who to endorse so uh, with that would love to hand it off to you for a brief intro and uh, you know let us know why are you running for uh, supervisor again uh, re-electing yeah yeah well thank thank you so much um, Stephen and, and for everyone for this opportunity to um, yeah to to discuss the important issues, um, particularly around housing, addressing the housing crisis in our city, with we to, to seek your um, endorsement for for re-election um, for District Four Supervisor. Um, you know, I did want to start off by by really actually thanking SFEMB and, and the YMB movement for for really pushing um, pushing so hard and boldly and aggressively, you know, um, on our our leaders both locally and statewide. You know to address the housing crisis um, that is impacting so many folks um, at, at all income levels in our city and state so um, you guys you know obviously you, you you know that you've had a huge impact on um yeah on on the public conversation about these issues and 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 actual policy and and um and and, and specific projects that have moved forward so thanks and i you know i would say that i'm i i absolutely share your, the goals of, of SFEMB and the YIMBY movement about, you know, look, seeing the housing crisis as our top priority in the city to address. In fact, that's the the, the number one issue that led me to, to take the step of um, transitioning from my 25 plus years as a progressive community and labor organizer in our city um, to, to, to wanna, you know, seek, seek the district court supervisor office and, and, and be a public official to bring what I can and um, to, to help address the housing crisis um, and, and it's really like personal for me too. Um, I mean, my daughter's in high school right now, a senior at Lowell, and you know she's getting, you know, ready. She's she's eager to leave home and become an, an adult, you know, soon. And um, you know, so I, I you know really um, see people like her and 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 young people growing up in our city um, and wanting to make sure that they they have a future here, you know, if they want to be here um, and be able to afford to live to live in the city and the community that they're being raised in. So um, and. And so, yeah, I um, and and I would say in my first term as supervisor, you know, expanding housing in District Four and 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 on the West Side has been one of my top priorities. And and um and and you know, I appreciate the work that um, I've done specifically with 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 you guys on on the contentious twenty five fifty Irving, you know, affordable housing development. Um, that was is so important. Um, and and really historic for the Sunset and the West Side. So, um, um, yeah, and, and I, you know, just maybe one final point, you know, more general point is I, you know, I, I've also been um, a strong proponent and a champion of a comprehensive community planning. So that, that includes expanding housing, particularly housing that meets the needs of our, our community. Um, but also um, we need to plan for um, the other other, other important um, infrastructure investments that, that go along with, with increased housing density in the sunset, the west side, you know, transportation and sustainable modes of transportation. Um, that, that's been public and public transit. That's been a high priority for me. Um, and, and, um, and also just planning for um, complete neighborhoods and communities um, with, with services, um, community building spaces, you know, like, like the Great Highway and the Outer Sunset Farmers Market and JFK Drive Promenade. Um, and, and, um, yeah, so 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 I I initiated and and work with the planning department and the district four youth and families network on the sunset forward um, community based planning process over the last two years that now lays out a framework for ho increasing housing density and housing in the sunset, but also um, expanding public services for seniors and families, um, um, improving supporting our small businesses and commercial corridors and then improving public transit service and, and sustainable modes of transportation. And that's gonna be the framework for, for my work in my second term. 
Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much for that background. Um, I guess we'd love to start off just, uh, you know, why are you the pro-housing candidate? Uh, tell us why you believe that out of the choices in this election, you would be the best on housing. Um, well, I, I would, I guess I would point to my track record of accomplishments, at, you know, my first term as what, and that distinguishes me from my opponents. Um, it's down to one, it looks like, as of an hour ago. Um, you know, who really have have no track record of accomplishments on, on any any issues of importance, whether it's housing, public safety, supporting our schools, um, and 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 addressing the climate emergency and and um, you know in and expanding public transit service and sustainable modes of transportation. So on housing, you know, I'm really proud of of the work that I've done in my first term to really um, expand and, and champion expanding housing. Um, opportunities in 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 the Sunset District and on the West Side. You know, I sponsored the legislation. Um, I was the lead sponsor of the Priority Development Area legislation or resolution that the board adopted that designated um, um, new, you know, expanded priority development areas in our city to the West Side for the first time, and including um, you know the, the commercial and transit corridors in in District Four, um, and um, and then in my role as a member of the the, the the ABAG executive board. Yeah, I've been been also very much involved in the Plan Bay Area 2050 plot process. Um, and um, in in that that's really a comp comprehensive planning um, yeah, to meet the needs. And then again, um, in, you know, I, I there's been a historic um, amount of new housing that that's been um, moved forward in District 4 since I stepped into office in, in 2019. There have been eight new multi-unit um, housing developments that have either been constructed, um, permitted, or, or proposed in District 4. Um, two of them are 100% affordable. You know, there's a 2550 Irving project and also the Shirley Chisholm Village, our city's first ever affordable housing project, and six market rate projects um, with BMR units included. Excellent. Yep, that's right. And we've definitely, um, uh, you know, appreciate your work on the 2550 Irving Street project. That was a big, uh, uh, you know, it's always tough when you have uh, your neighbors that are uh, kind of going apoplectic about things, but it, you know, we do appreciate showing leadership and uh, uh, showing that uh, this was going to be an improvement in the neighborhood and, you know, all the, the fear mongering was, was really not uh, worth it. Uh, but you know, I would actually like to maybe just talk a little bit about um, that project in particular. So I guess, you know, we'll kind of skip around, but, you know, the, for that project there, now that we're kind of past the, the approval process, you know, if, if you look back, is there anything you would have done differently? Do you feel like the, the effort to kind of reduce the size and the unit count, was that, was there any merit in that? Would you have, uh, you know, listened to the neighbor's concerns or, you know, how, how would you address that if you could go back and do it again? Yeah, I well, I think um, looking back on the what was has been an extremely contentious um, neighborhood engagement process around 2550 Irving. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to start off by saying that um, the the streamlining and, and the ministerial approval that this project was able to to qualify for under SB 35 was mm -hmm. absolutely critical. Yeah. In allowing the project to move forward because um, without that, yeah, it would have been mired in in all kinds of yeah, um, you know, uh, appeals and 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 strong NIMBY opposition um, that just would have killed the project um, from from the start. Um, but I, I would say that even with the streamlining and and of, of important projects like this and and others, it's it's you know I still believe it's important to go through. Um, in, you know, a meaningful neighborhood engagement process and really build popular support for, for projects like this and, and others um, and not have, um, you know, folks just feel like it's being forced down their throats. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was, um, so I was 110%, you know, in support of 2550 Irving from the very beginning. You know, I was the, the main target of the extreme NIMBY opposition to this project. You know, they protested at my house. They, they, were, they were calls to recall Gordon Marr last year you know, that was the whole part of the recall fever. But, but I, I did, I did, I do, I did then, I did do believe that it's important to, um, 
you know, for developers, nonprofit and, and for-profit developers to engage with the neighborhood. And um, so that's why we went through a year long process, you know, TNDC, the mayor's office and I engaging with the neighbor, neighborhood around this. And, and, um, and, and the, the organized opposition to it, the, the homeowner association right around 2550 Irving, you know, was during that year long process, they moved from the position of no slums in the sunset, you know, and Gordon Marr is a communist, you know, that, that's what it was in the beginning of the process to, um, to, say, to supporting, uh, you know, a, six, six, a slightly reduced size project, six stories, you know, um, 80 units was their proposal um, and, and supporting particularly the permanent supportive housing in, in the project, you know, which I think was a big um, step for the, for the neighbors to, to, to support. Um, so they were literally um, supporting building 100% affordable housing for low-income families and, and formerly homeless residents in their backyard. I mean, these are the people that live right next door to the project. So I did support, end up, you know, as you know, supporting um, the community's um, slightly mod compromised um, project. And I don't, yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't, yeah. And, I, and you know, I and guess, I, did you feel the uh, concerns around the, uh, ground soil uh, contamination mitigation measures was that warranted or was that just more NIMBY, you know, nonsense? No, that I don't see that as NIMBY. I mean, that some some of the folks who who latched onto that issue, maybe it was was not sincere, and and it was just they were just grasping for um for things to oppose the project. But um, but I think it's it's a legitimate issue. Um, you know, it it was only because of the development project. 20, at 2550 Irving, that PCE contamination in the soil vapor was discovered, and then from there, there were te there was testing done across the street, um, and it was discovered that there's a plume of PCE soil in the soil vapor on the entire block, mm -hmm. um, and so that's led to um, five separate um, oversight agreements um, with by, by the Department of Toxic Substance Control on this block um, to analyze the source of the contamination and to come up with a a, you know, a mitigation or remediation plan. And I've been supporting and working with the neighbors on, on pushing the state DTSC to conduct a comprehensive coordinated um, analysis of this large plume of PCE contamination in the soil vapor and, mm -hmm. and to mitigate and remediate, remediate it as much as possible to protect the community's health. And I don't, so I think the community deserves new housing, new affordable housing is free, but also, um, environmental health concerns to be addressed as well. Yeah, I guess uh, not the first time, not the last time we'll build on a gas station or, you know, mm -hmm. laundromat. So this is not an impossible problem to fix, yeah. Right. Okay, great. Let's continue on. So we have a very active chat. We'll definitely get to everyone's questions at the end, um, but a few uh, big questions I wanna get through. So uh, biggest measure on our, uh, radar this year, of course, is uh, Proposition D, Affordable Homes Now. Uh, this is our uh, been, been sponsored by Yimby and uh, 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 SFHAC and uh, many, many groups in the city. Uh, also on the ballot is Proposition E, and this unfortunately both cannot pass. So I guess we want to understand, uh, I believe during the vote of the SFDCCC, you voted for both measures, right? And so, you know, walk us through that vote. If we, if only one can pass, I guess, why, why, why endorse both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know um, I might be one of the few people in the city that is supporting both measures. And, um, and for me, it just comes from, again, my number one priority as, as district four supervisor, and that's um, expanding affordable housing in our city to that, to meet, to meet the urgent needs of, of folks that are priced out right now, especially on the west side and in my district. So the goals of both both of these measures are, are to make it quicker and, and easier and che ultimately cheaper to build affordable housing. So I absolutely support the goals of both. Um, you know, that there's different um, policy, the, you know, specifics are different between the measures. You know, I think there's, there's pros and cons to both, mm -hmm. but, um, but I do support both, and um, and I think it's up to the voters, you know, just to decide, um, which, you know, which one, 
you know, is, is the best. Um, and just, I, I would also add, you know, that, um, you know, I feel like, um, you know, that having these two competing measures, that's obviously on, on the ballot, you know, not good. Um, and, and it's confusing for the voters and, and it, but it also reflects, you know, I think the unfortunate polarized, um, um, situation we have right now around how, to, how, how we could expand housing and address the housing affordability crisis. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to, um, um, you know, focus, focus on, on real solutions and not get, get dragged into the, um, too much into the, the what I feel like is, is an un, unhelpful and, and, um, and polarized debate. You know, honestly, it's between, you know, well, NIMBYs and YIMBYs, but I know, yeah. So, and I, and I, I would just like to see us focus on, on, on real solutions. I, I hear you there. So I guess um, one thing I would want to ask you is like, you know, if you're talking to your colleagues and you had to, you know, convince them of one, well, and you, and just yeah. say you had to, you know, convince them of D, how would you say, you know, how would you tell them to vote for D? Well, I think one, one of the key differences and, and in, in Prop D is, is the, the AMI level, um, you know, for, for affordable housing, you know, um, being bumped up to 140% of AMI from, from 120. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I actually do support that. And, and I, I, for me, and in fact, in my looking ahead, I really want to focus a lot more on, on, um, facilitating and supporting the construction of, of the missing middle housing and, and middle income housing. So I do see 140% AMI, there's still a need for, for, um, for the city to help support that, 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 that income level of development. So, and I know there's, there's a just, you know, a lot of my colleagues and, and folks, you know, maybe in the affordable housing community, um, you know, see that as a threat somehow to, to, to us also building the housing for low, lower income tiers, but, but I don't see that. I, I see that we do need middle income housing in our city. So. This would be teachers, firefighters, yeah. police officers. Yeah. Exactly. And, and that, that's, you know, for my district and, and on the West side, I mean, that's, you know, really, you know, you know, historically been, been the folks that have been attracted to our neighborhood and, and see the sunset and the West side as an opportunity for, for home ownership. And economic security, but they're absolutely priced out right now and, and moving, you know, they, yeah, out of the city. And it's, and it, there's a generational gap here, right? It's, it's really, um, you know, folks that were able to buy a house, working class, middle class folks, you know, maybe, maybe 15 years ago, like myself, honestly, we, I wouldn't still be here. My family wouldn't be here if we weren't able to buy a house, you know, 15 years ago. Um, but, um, that's, those opportunities don't exist anymore. So, under for 140 percent AMI, I would agree. It, we we do need to to incentivize that type of um, development. Excellent. Okay. Um, okay. Moving on to the housing element. So we um, are mandated by state law to build 82,000 homes. Where would you put those homes? Um, well, I would put significant amount of it um, in district four and, and on the west side, you know, I'm in agreement with, you know, with, with that as a general goal that, um, and um, yeah, and as far as how much of it, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, that's a complicated question. And um, I, but I look forward to, you know, it, engaging in the, um, the public process and, and especially with my constituents and, in, and folks in district four about, you know, um, how much, you know, we really can accommodate and should accommodate in the district and, and, but also more importantly, like what, what type of housing it is to and, and, and who, who it's really targeting. So I want to make sure that um, the housing that we, we will build in, in, on the West side is housing that's meeting the needs of the community. And I would just highlight, you know, um, that again, of the eight, eight projects, um, multi-unit projects that have moved forward in, in, in my first term, um, the first, their very first one was the Westerly. Um, that's a, a 50, 56 unit condo across from the zoo on slope. And that was completed um, three years ago, about right now. And, and they started selling those three years ago. And it's still, yeah, I think at least um, 30, a third of the units haven't sold yet after three years. 
Uh, okay. And all the com commercial space in that building is still vacant after three years. So um, that's an example of building housing that obviously is not meeting the needs of the community or even the market needs, you know? So, um, so I wanna see how we can make sure that what's built is actually meeting, meeting market needs, meeting community needs. You know, just related to that, the retail space issue, I, you know, you see a lot of vacant spaces and I've talked to merchants and they say, hey, we can't afford the rent that these places are asking for. I guess, would you have any policy solution to that? Because nobody loves vacant spaces. And then obviously we can't support our small businesses if they can't afford the rent. So I guess, how do we bridge that? Gap? Mm -hmm. Well, we do. <clears throat> I mean, we did, we, we did enact the, um, the vacant, vacant storefront tax, right? And in, in a number of years ago it was in, um, implementation of it was put on hold during the pandemic, but now it is gonna be um, starting to be um, um, implemented, um, I believe this year. Yeah, so, so I think that will help in um, cre cre creating a, a financial disincentive for, for landlords, commercial landlords to keep their, their sites vacant. And, and the goal of that is to, um, to give um, small businesses and, and commercial tenants more leverage in negotiating a fair lease. So mm -hmm. I think one important policy and, but we, I think we have to be proactive too in, um, in, 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 in ways to bring New, new small businesses um, in, in, into vacant storefronts in our commercial quarters. Um, so, yeah. Well, I guess specifically relating to housing, new projects basically have to have this retail space attached to them. And, you know, I've talked to developers who basically write it off. They assume they're going to get no income from this space, but they have to, you know, because it's a requirement. Would you consider maybe, you know, modifying these requirements to, you know, so you don't, you're not basically wasting space on, these vacant areas. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, that's an issue that I've, that has definitely come up in in the development. You know, the the developments in my district and and the re, the ground floor retail space and who, yeah, whether there's really a market for that. Um, <clears throat> even at twenty five fifty Irving, right? There, originally, there was a plan to do ground floor retail in that building, but through the the year long community engagement process, you know, at least that was one meaningful um, um, sort of impact that I think the engagement process had was it we the retail <clears throat> ground floor retail space was removed mm -hmm. uh, given the, the the extensive vacancies that exist on Irving and and instead it's, it's community space that was included which I think is really positive um, and there's discussions with the Sunset Chinese Cultural District with I which I helped to create with community leaders of, of um, of, of possibly occupying that space, which would be perfect. So I think looking at maybe community serving, commu creating community space, or certainly ground floor housing, I would support that as well. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, the, the um, Balboa Upper Yard project, it has like a YMC on the bottom level and like, mm -hmm. care and like, you know, that kind of thing. Like that's super high demand. There, people are definitely use that. So. Yeah. Love that. Child, child care or preschool space, yeah. Uh, so great, so moving on to, um, you know, just talk about housing on the west side, like really go into detail. Uh, so district four has all these great amenities, good transit, uh, great schools, uh, but it's historically not been a model of dense housing. We've built the vast majority of our housing on the east side. I was just looking at the stats. Um, in the past year, we have built 285 units in District 4. Sorry, that is in the past four years. So okay. I guess, how would we change that uh, trajectory going forward, specifically? Yeah. Going as much detail as you can. Well, again, in my first term, <clears throat> we've already taken great strides, you know, to, to change that. I mean, the, and these are, you know, these are small steps, right? It's not going to change overnight. But again, we have eight new multifamily projects or multi-unit projects move, um, moving ahead in the district. And, um, um, you know, I, you know, I sponsored the priority development area resolution that created, you know, new, new PDAs in districts one, four, and seven. So, um, 
definitely see those those priority development areas. And and I think for District Four, you know, that's on the um, the Irving Judah corridor and then Terrebonne corridor. I think Noriega is also um, would also be a great corridor to you know to add um, significant new housing. Hmm. Um, and, and I feel like it's already zoned for that, you know, um, you know, that you can, uh, the zoning already allows four or five stories. And then with, um, the density bonuses that are available state and local, you know, as you can see, we've, we've seen with 25 feet here, you could go up to seven stories. Mm -hmm. So I think, that, um, and, and at least right now, at least four and five story buildings are, that's what the rest of the, the, the projects with 25 to 50 Irving aside have, have been. Um, that's, there's no opposition to that, that type of height. I think seven stories, you know, in a little bit, but, but I think that was, that was a constructive, that's positive to push the discussion on, on height, especially on, on our um, commercial and transit corridors. Um, and then I, I also view, I've been viewing our single family homes as, as not the problem of, of, and, of, of our housing crisis, but actually an opportunity, a great opportunity to expand housing. Um, and um, that's why I've been a champion of accessory dwelling units. You know, I sponsored the legislation to waive the building permit fees on AD, for new ADU construction as a financial incentive. I created an ADU pilot program in District 4 with the Planning Department and Asian Inc. and Asian American Contractors Association that's provided technical assistance for homeowners to, to expand ADUs. And then I sponsored the the housing development incentive program legislation that the board adopted two or three months ago that expands and scales it up citywide to, to support single family homeowners to add an ADU, but also duplex and fourplex um, that's allowed under SB9 and whatever local fourplex we may may pass here. Um, and, and there's been a lot of support for, for this type of develop, homeowner centered small scale development in our single family home, particularly in the Chinese community and the Asian community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. Uh, so I guess kind of dovetailing into duplexes, fourplexes, SB9, uh, you know, recent analysis by SF planning department showed that because of the high construction costs, these fourplex projects generally do not pencil out if you're trying to, you know, break even on your construction costs and, and what you could ultimately rent it out for. A cost, the cost of a unit of housing on average is around 700,000 per unit. What would you do to help address this cost? Uh, since ultimately that means less uh, multifamily units built, and if it's subsidized housing, that that means less units of housing. So, you know, what would you do to address the cost? Yeah, well, this is an issue that I have <clears throat> really focused on. I, you you may know that I had my own fourplex proposal. Um, you know, during during. The, over the last six months during the, during the pretty extensive discussion we've had about lo a local fourplex measure in mine um, did include um, affordability requirements for for the bonus units um, of 100 at 100 percent AMI um, and but then through work with the planning department you know that in the feasibility analysis you know it became clear that that was that was not feasible to, to ha include that that affordability requirement so um, so but I, I, I really appreciate it and, and thought it would go through that public public process. Um, a couple of ways that I, I see that we can address the, um, yeah, this challenge, the feasibility challenge for, for these small scale developments is um, one is to center, focus on homeowners as a developer rather than um, a speculator or developer, because then you, re you remove the acquisition cost, right? And, and that's a significant reason why these projects are not feasible um, is because the acquisition cost is, is you know, probably $1.5 million or more, at least in the Sunset District. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but if a homeowner doesn't have that, that cost, and, and in fact, they have equity in their home of one to $2 million that could be tapped. So that's one thing. And um, the other um, way to drive is by providing financial assistance and financial incentives for these projects. So that's what I, I'm working on. That's that's part of the housing development incentive program um, is to um, look at how we can offer low or no interest loans, you know, for these projects and also looking at a way to <clears throat> to provide a, a rebate or, or grants that would cover the increased property tax that that the homeowner would 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 see as a result of, of these small scale developments. Yeah. 
So focus on uh, folks that already have the home, so less land cost and financing to kind of help bridge the gap between just the high cost of construction and the uh, rents that they could rent it out for. Yeah. That's cool. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, let's move on to, uh, you know, we are kind of running late on, a little late on time, so I think we might need to just uh, get through some more of these. Um, uh, rent control. So powerful tool to stabilize neighborhoods, prevent displace displacement, uh, but when you poorly design rent control, it can hinder development and make housing projects unviable. Um, I guess, how do you achieve both? How do you see balancing, keeping tenants in place, but also not uh, limiting the um, units that could be created for future residents? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I'm a strong supporter of rent control and I believe SFEMB and, and you guys are too. And, um, you know, that that's, in such an important um, tool to, um, yeah, to assure that um, tenants and especially long-term tenants are able to stay in our communities, in our city. Um, I, I think when it, applying rent control to new developments, um, my position right now is that, you know, I don't really see that as a problem um, because new developments and including new ADUs, duplexes and fourplexes, and, um, will be able to rent at market rate. Um, so like, I don't really see that as impacting the feasibility um, of small scale or even large scale developments is to, you know, by by putting them under our rent stabilization ordinance. Um, right. I know there's there's some, you know, I, I've heard that there's there's some analysis that shows that it does impact particularly the, the, the larger scale developments um, when it comes to the financing and, and other considerations. So that's something I would like to understand better, but. Got it. Makes sense. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about our favorite project, um, 469 Stevenson. So last year we had a CEQA appeal that went to the Board of Supervisors. This was to replace a Nordstrom parking lot with a uh, 495 unit apartment, which would have been close to BART, uh, a lot of jobs. Can you talk us through your reasoning behind your vote? I guess people want to understand how the parking lot benefits anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm in agreement with you there. Yeah, the parking lot, need we need to build housing on that site. I've, and, um, um, and I, you know, I did support the, 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 the CEQA appeal at the board, as you know. And for me, my main issue was, you know, my concern around how this development um, would impact the 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 extremely low income um, um, Sixth Street, you know, corridor, and um, um, yeah, and and potentially you know fuel uh, um, displacement of, of low income tenants and 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 low income residents in that area, mm -hmm. um, and um, but I also acknowledge that CEQA. Um, is not the best tool to um, to really get at issues like that, and um, yeah. So, so I think we um, um, we we need to look at um, uh, alternative ways. I think to um, to address legitimate concerns around um, major new developments like four sixty nine Stevenson um, outside of Sequa. Yeah. yeah. Fair point. Um, yeah, I guess the displacement was not in the CEQA document. I guess it's not like a requirement. So, yeah. It's yeah. Just, Although I, I totally understand it's, you know, a lot of residents that are very vulnerable. So, you know, we got to build this. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's the venue, I guess, that kind of makes people scratch their heads. Yeah. Okay, so let's. Um... Hey, Stephen, can I just maybe add to that and, and even connect it back to twenty five fifty Irving because um, you know that that again that was streamlined through SB thirty five, so there was no it was exempted from CEQA, and um, you know and and I do support that you know especially for for clearly ne much needed community serving develop you know affordable housing development like that, but at the same time you know as I mentioned I I do believe that the environmental 
issues. Um, it's not really as a result of the development, the environmental impacts of that development of 2550 Irving, but the environmental issues that were uncovered because of the development, you know, the, the, the contamination that, that's been in the soil for decades um, should be addressed as well. And um, so that's why I've been working on, um, on, on with the Department of Toxic Substance Control in, in ensuring a, a comprehensive coordinated analysis and, and appropriate um, mitigation and cleanup there. So, um, no, I, I don't think anybody does that. That's a you know real concern. Obviously, neighbors can't be you know living next to toxic. You want to build something that's helping the community. So, yeah, but that I, I don't think uh, anybody doubts. Okay. So we're going to move on to our quick fire round. Uh, well, here, let's, let's take a couple of questions since people have been asking in the chat. So let's see, first off, uh, Janice, question. What have you learned regarding housing and how have you, your ideas changed or not changed since you've been District 4 Superman? Um, yeah, I, I um, well, I always, Stepping into this role, I always knew housing, knew housing development, and and um, was was not only one of the most important issues in the city, but also one of the most contentious. So, um, you know, I, um, you know, I, I would say stepping in, you know, in in my first term, you know, I'm not, and I say this in in a way that might sound pandering, but um, but my my perspectives of the Yimby, you know, SF Yimby and the Yimby movement have, I think. Um, changed you know and i came into this as a clearly a progressive you know community and labor organizer with um but honestly with, with not necessarily a lot of direct experience in housing development um in, in housing policy so um you know i have appreciated the um yeah um you know the, the role that you've played and especially around 2550 irving honestly you guys were, were were one of the groups that really stepped up the most in 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 working you know with us to push back on the extreme NIMBYism there. So, um. All right. yeah, I appreciate it. It was, okay. really, I, I thought it was kind of fun. We were, we were there doing a rally. We had people with bullhorns yelling at us and I don't yeah. know, it was, it was great to stand up for something to believe in. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so I guess, uh, let's see, we'll kind of get a couple more in here. And then, um, so Martin says, now that the anti-great walkway candidate is out of contention, will you commit to including Friday in the Upper Great Highway Compromise? Yeah, um, thanks for that question, Martin. Um, I, you know, I think um, um, my, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep my focus on, on the prize, you know, and, and the bigger, the bigger picture and not get too distracted by, um, um, what I feel like are, are, are slightly lesser details, like like when when the Great Highway is closed to vehicles on Fridays. Mm -hmm. So for me, the the bigger the bigger pr prize and vision is is what we've shown. You know, the Great Highway can and should and needs to be in the future. You know, during the pandemic. So that's what I'm committed to um, to working on. And um, and but I want to do it in a responsible way that with a with, with a tr proper traffic management plan, with significant increases in public transit service to, to the far west side of the city, so, so that we can um, make it a popular, this, this a popular vision too, and, and, and build more support for it, so. Got it. Okay. So I'm, but I'm, not to not answer that question, I'm not sure what's gonna happen with the Friday afternoon closure time. I mean, I'm, I'm working with my colleagues on, I, you know that I introduced legislation before the break that we're, it's going to be moving forward in September um, to keep this um, weekday weekend compromise in place until the Great Highway Annex of Southern Stretch closes in, in another year and a half to two years. Um, and at that time, I really feel like it's going to become clear to everyone that this is not going to be this is not useful as a roadway anymore. And and um, but um, it's blowing into the sea, right? Or it's getting Covered yeah. by sand and yeah, Absolutely. well, you know, definitely something I've heard from a lot of EMBs is they all really do see transit as one of your strengths and and you know you leading on stuff like Great Highway, uh, car free GFK I think is is a huge <laughs> um, you know selling point for a lot of EMBs. So uh, would also love to see 
Uh, let's see. So I've got we'll get one more question from the audience. So duh, 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 duh. Um, let me just get through here. So here. Yeah. Okay. So we have a question from Bob. Uh, one of our uh, good good friends in Yimby, Jane Natoli. She was nominated for SFMTA. Um, she's progressive, forward thinking, transit oriented. Could you just walk us through the vote? I, I think a lot of folks felt like it was it was just partisanship, but you know maybe yeah. you could help explain it. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I mean, Jane. Yeah, I, I'm, that was like three years ago. I'm I'm just trying to remember. I know I I did end up voting. Um, yeah, not not to approve Jane's appointment. Um, and um, um, so I, I mean, if you could do it again, would you you know reconsider? I guess knowing that Yimbys aren't that bad. <laughs> um, I think especially on on transit. And because that we were talking about, yeah, yeah, transit issues where which I feel like we're 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 very much aligned it on now. So um, I think in reflecting back, I honestly I can't remember what what the specific issues are, but, but it probably was more, yeah, we acknowledge more connected to broader political dynamics. So, but I feel like, um, and I've moved on on transit issues too. Honestly, you know, I've been I've been hesitant, you know, given the the transit nimbyism in my neighborhood um, to, to, to um, you know, to come out stronger on it. But I think working with you guys and, and the Great Highway Park, you know, Kids Safe SF has given me much more confidence to, you know, to, um, yeah, to, yeah, to take stronger positions on these issues. So yes, I, I, I would definitely would, would, um, would yeah, um, would definitely like take, take it, take, be much more supportive of Jane um, being appointed to a transportation agency right now than I, than I was, you know, back then. So. Awesome here. And I would say, if there is a ray of hope to get through the partisanship, it's on transit issues where mm -hmm. EMVs and, and progressive folks working together. And uh, yeah, I hear you there. Um, I also say I do respect that you, uh, you know, ride the e-bike around town. I just, I think that's great. So, yeah. yeah. It's no, it's definitely been been transformative for me. That's the first time I'm riding a bike for transportation and not just recreation. And um, and then it's moved me politically on, on these issues too. Honestly, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think we're you know way over time. Um, I do appreciate you've been very generous with your time. Um, yeah, any last words you'd like to leave uh, our membership with? Uh, to think about uh, for the endorsement process? Um, not so much around the endorsement process. I mean, I think, um, you know, through this conversation, you know, hopefully you have a better sense of where I stand on, on, on these. And, and, and currently, and my position on these issues have sort of evolved in my first term, and they, I think they continue to, um, and also the transportation and transit issues. Um, but I, I would say that I, I would like to make, I, I will make a, a commitment to, to more actively engage with with you guys. I don't know that we've even had a formal meeting. Um, we we didn't even meet about twenty five fifty Irving. I just knew you guys were just da down and and you know and working on it. So I appreciate that. So I would love to figure out a way how we can actually have more regular communication and, and collaboration on housing, transportation issues, and other things that are important. Absolutely. Well, we'd love to hear it, and we would love to collaborate on future projects. We want to see you know, 50 more, 25, 50 Irving. So, you know, anytime that happens, we'll be there. Mm -hmm. okay, well, uh, thank you so much for speaking right. with the supervisor. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, you enjoy your weekend and uh, thanks again. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Stephen. Right. Bye. Bye everyone.